Well, good morning and welcome. It's good to see you all here this morning. Lovely morning, beautiful morning. Other than the bugs, it's about perfect. And uh, so we're happy to be gathered here at Lewis Lake in the house of the Lord to worship him this morning. Just kind of, uh, it's kind of a, after all the festivities of last week, this week is just kind of a a deep breath and we're just not going to do anything too earth shattering and uh, just take it easy this week. And so so we're going to do that. I do want to uh, say thanks to everyone who helped last week uh, with Pastor Bob's celebration. That was, uh, it was a wonderful day. It was a busy day. Uh, It was a full day. But I uh, just want to uh, make mention of the, uh, all of you helped in so many ways. Um, Becky put together all the decorations. Rick and Angie took care of the food. Um, the deacons and the ushers were setting up chairs and tables all day. And uh, so that was something. Betty scoured the archives. Bob was like, where did you get all that footage? He's like, well, Betty and Jesse were scouring the archives. And, uh, and it's not easy to take, you know, it's not automatic to take video clips from an old camcorder and get them up on that screen somehow. That's a, that's a challenge to digitize all that. So we're thankful for that. Tanya Burke did uh, photography. Looking forward to seeing what she captured. And Bev and Danny were working together on those window gifts. And Brian Hadoba had all kinds of stuff going on. So it was just a great day. And Bob and Sandy were happy. And, and we're happy. And that yeah, was wonderful. And uh, so, so that's great. Thanks to all of you who, who did that. Our call to worship comes from 1 Peter chapter 2. And it says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. We'll be talking in the next week or two about honorable behavior. And so this reminder from Peter is, I think, appropriate for us to behave honorably in a very dishonorable way sort of day. So, um, oh, one other thing that I forgot to announce. Ushers, would you come forward? It's Mission Sunday, and so on Mission Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, we take up a special offering that goes directly to our missionaries, and so if you'd like to contribute to that, grab an envelope here from the basket, and uh, you can put your offering in there and, and put it in the offering plate when, uh, when that comes around in a little bit. So yeah, just go ahead and grab these and ship them out. We can send them out without any ceremony at all. And also in that basket, if you're a visitor, there's a connect card in there, and you can fill that out and let us know that you are here and help us connect with you a little bit. That would be very helpful. Um, I'm guessing after the sermon today, you won't want to, and I may be fired, but uh, we'll, we'll see about all that. <laughs> I was uh, looking at the text that is that the Lord has given to us this morning, I thought, you know, for my first Sunday as senior pastor of Lewis Lake, this is just trouble. <laughs> so um, we're, we're looking forward to the time in the Word of God, but uh, maybe a little nervous too. All right. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Galatians. Fascinating portion of scripture. Listen to the Word of God. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Notice how he just hammers them with questions. Just gives it to them. But questions are a powerful way to help convince somebody. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? No, then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by 
all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it's evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. This is the inspired, infallible Word of God. If you have a Bible with you, I invite you to open it to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 to 29. This is a uh, much lesser known story about Noah. Every children's Bible has the story of Noah in it. Every good Bible storybook has the story of Noah in it. I don't know of any that have this story of Noah in it. They all just sort of end at the rainbow. Rainbow comes and it's beautiful and it's new creation and everybody's happy. But that's not where the story of Noah ends. And it is our task to look at the end this morning. Let me just give you a heads up for what we're going to do. I had um, on your sheet, we're only going to cover the first point number one, all right? So if you get nervous, it's like, man, he's been going for 90 minutes and we're not even on two. Well, that's okay. We're not going to two. So uh, as I began to, to pull this together, I thought we're just going to park here on point number one. Here is the word of God, Genesis 9, beginning in verse 18. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Hmm, that would be fun. <laughs> Heavenly Father, you have given us your word to instruct us, to teach us, to draw us ever near to yourself, to build up the body of Christ. Lord, as we open this unusual portion or part of it, we ask for your grace and your help. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis introduces us to the world. Genesis helps us answer questions like, where did the world come from? Who put it here? What's going on? How does the world work? What's my place in it? Genesis starts with God making the heavens and the earth, and the earth is a big ball covered in water, and then the Spirit, the Ruach of God, hovers over it and gives it shape and brings out about dry land and plants and animals and man. And then we've come to the flood, and the flood hits, and when the flood hits, the earth is a 
big ball of water until, as Pastor Bob talked about a couple weeks ago, a wind, a ruach, begins to blow and the dry land appears and the little olive trees started sprouting and Noah and the animals all went out. And it's, it's a restart. It's a recreation. It's a new world. And in the original creation, the first man, Adam, finds himself in a garden. And in that garden, he commits a terrible sin that involves fruit. And afterwards, he realizes he's naked. Then Adam fathers two sons who are at odds with each other. In our story this morning that we just read, Noah, the first man in this new world, plants a vineyard. He becomes a gardener. He commits a terrible sin involving fruit. He realizes he is naked and his sons, who are brothers, are at odds with each other. It's kind of the same story, just a little different. And there are some differences. In Noah's story, there's no snake tempting him. There's no woman offering him the fruit. So we can say, well, why does Noah sin? And the answer for Noah's sin is that Sin is in his heart. He is the best of humanity, as Clark already told us. He is a righteous man. But Noah brings into this new world the virus of sin, and it's going to reinfect the world until it becomes just about as bad as it was before. In Adam's story, God covers his nakedness. In Noah's story, his sons cover his nakedness. In Adam's story, the snake is cursed, and Adam is cursed. In Noah's story, Ham. And Noah's son, really his grandson, Canaan, is cursed. Uh, As I was pondering this text, and Noah, uh, I realized that this, this text lays forth many powerful realities of the world in which we live. And and there's some significant lessons to draw from this. And we're just going to cover the first one today. And uh, this incredible reality of the world in which we find ourselves living, the world in which Noah lived in. And that is simply this. Danger lurks within the best of things. Danger lurks within the best of things. The other blanks you're going to have to get next week. What do we say about Noah planting a vineyard? What do you suppose he expected to get out of it? Well, either Noah expected he could get some grapes that he could enjoy for a few weeks a year while they were in season, or perhaps Noah expected to make wine, which could be stored and enjoyed all year long. I think that's probably pretty reasonable. In the Bible, wine is a wonderful thing. We're going to see that very clearly. Noah was right to plant a vineyard. He was right to make wine. He was right to enjoy some of it. But in that wine, a tremendous danger lurked, and Noah ends up drinking way too much of it, which probably means it wasn't an accident. He didn't drink the excess by mistake he did it on purpose he ends up losing control of his mind he ends up naked in his tent passed out very disgraceful position for the most righteous man in the world ham noah's son comes in sees noah the hebrew suggests that ham looks at his father With a sense of glee, he takes delight in Noah's disgrace. Noah's going to curse Ham's offspring. And we're off to a really terrible start in this new world. Because within even the best of things, there is a terrible danger that lurks. In the best of things, a danger lurks. One of the best gifts that God has given humanity is the gift of sex. And there is a terrible danger that lurks Beneath that gift, it has destroyed and continues to destroy countless lives. Money is a wonderful thing. It's a gift from God. Money essentially represents work accomplished. And when God blesses our work, our money increases. That's a good thing. Proverbs encourages us to work and to work hard and to have our barns filled. 
But do you know that a person can destroy himself and destroy other people with money? A person with money can use that money to support their laziness, their wickedness, their addictions. People use money to control other people. People have, in the past, used money to try to control a church. People like Ananias and Sapphira used money to try to win the praise of people. The Apostle Paul actually ran into a guy who tried to buy the power to perform miracles with money. And Paul cursed him. The Bible warns us very clearly about the danger of wanting money. Just wanting it is a danger. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, and into many uh, senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Not, money is not the root of all kinds of evils, but the love of it. And it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierce themselves with many pangs. There's a, there's a dangerous side to money because it's something that we can easily love and that love can destroy us and other people. Jesus said, whoops, sorry, I didn't give you that one. Jesus said, when he was talking about the rich man, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that remarkable? Think about that next time you, you want to be rich. Jesus said, hard for rich people to enter the kingdom. In Hebrews 11, we read that Moses passed up the riches of Egypt for loyalty to God and to his people because in Moses' case, he couldn't have both. He couldn't be the the prince of Egypt with all that that afforded and a faithful servant of God leading his people out of Egypt. We could say the same thing for any number of other good things. Power. Power is a wonderful thing, a a gift that comes from God. It has a tremendous downside. It gets abused terribly. Fame and and glory and the praise of people, that's that's good. We We should enjoy those things, but there's a tremendous downside to those. Technology is a wonderful gift of God. You you think of the wonderful, time-saving, life-enriching devices that we have. I, I used to do this, and I didn't know if you could still do this, but I asked Siri this week. I said, Siri, what planes are flying overhead? And you know what? It showed up on my phone. There's a plane from Air Alaska flying this direction and a plane at 37,000 feet and another plane flying another direction at 35,000 feet, and all that information is right there. Anything that you want to know, you have at the palm of your hand. You can get that information in a heartbeat. That's an incredible thing. But you also know that in the pocket of every person with a phone is instant, free access to soul-sucking, literally brain-altering, relationship-destroying pornography. And in our nation and in our world, young men in particular are being destroyed by it. Families are being devastated by this epidemic of pornography, and it's everywhere, and it comes from the same device that makes your life so much easier. Because in the best of things, danger is lurking. Medical technology is a wonderful thing. It saves many lives, including mine. I would not be here, but for the uh, ability of doctors to perform C-sections, I would have died, my mother would have died, but I'm here and I'm thankful for that. There is a dark side to medical technology in China. Uh, Prisoners are uh, available for their organs. The the Chinese government will sell the organs of their prisoners. And no, they don't get their permission, they just take them. So the ability to transplant organs is a wonderful thing. But the ability to take the organs of a person who hasn't agreed to that is a terrible thing. I I learned this week that uh, in Haiti, half a century ago in Haiti, the island down in the Caribbean, Haiti was selling human blood to the United States. They, They engaged in a blood market. And, and Haitian blood was actually really desirable because those people lived in abject poverty among a lot of diseases. And so the immune systems of those people that were living was incredible. And their blood was really useful. 
And so there's a huge market for it here in the United States. The problem was that Haitian blood was collected and sold by the henchmen of Papadoc, one of the cruelest dictators of the 20th century. And I don't think that that blood was gotten in the same way that we're going to be getting blood here next Tuesday, on June 14th, when the American Red Cross comes in to do the blood drive. You see, there's a downside to the best of, of things. The general rule is that the more powerful a thing is, the more it can be either a blessing or a curse. And I don't think anybody pictured that better in story form than Tolkien with his Lord of the Rings series. This morning, I just want to talk with you about what the Bible says about alcohol. That's a thing that is wonderful, but lurking not far below the surface is a great danger. And Noah finds that out. This is So you can see how I'm going to get fired after today, right? Because this is not something we like to talk about. This is a tough subject. But we're going to go for it. As I studied this and was thinking about this, I was like, we're just going to go for it. This is not something we do often. If you're here, first-time visitor, sorry, we don't do this often. I've been preaching for 12 years and never done a sermon quite like this, so hang in there with me. We're going to look at what the Bible says about uh, wine in particular. Uh, let me just start by saying that any attempt to say the wine in the Bible doesn't have alcohol in it is doomed to, doomed to fail. You're going to see that very clearly. Uh, we can say that it was watered down often. It wasn't as strong as it is now, and that's fine. But, but the Hebrew word for wine is related to bubbles, and so fermentation is a part of it. And, and you'll see how even in the most positive portrayals of wine in the Bible, alcohol is really assumed. So let me walk through with you the blessings that wine was to, to God's people. Here's from Ecclesiastes. Go. Eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart. Uh, there's a connection in the Bible between drinking wine and having a merry heart. Okay, You drink the wine, your heart gets merry. You'll see that in a moment. God has already approved what you do. Ecclesiastes 10, bread is made for laughter and wine gladdens life and money answers everything. You get some bread, some wine, some money. Life is good to Solomon. Have you ever stopped to think, I thought about this this week, why, when grapes ferment, do they become alcoholic? And why does alcohol do what it does to our brains? Why? Well, the answer has to be that they do that because God made it that way. God didn't have to make it that way, but he did. And here's one reason why God did that. Here's Psalm 104. You, Lord, caused the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. It's a tremendous gift from God that comes to, to gladden the heart of man. We can be thankful for that. <laughs> this is interesting. Um, when we talk about uh, the Bible speaks of wine as being for our happiness. Here's interesting um, observation that Jesus' critics made. John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. So Jesus is talking here, and, uh, and he says, you know, John was very austere, right? He ate locusts and wild honey. He, didn't part, he was not a party animal by any stretch of the imagination. He didn't eat, he didn't drink. And the people looked at him and said, he has a demon. Like, there's, there's something wrong with him, right? That, that he wouldn't uh, behave normal. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Now, whatever we make of this verse, because this is Jesus' critics, right? And they're kind of exaggerating the case, of course. We can say that Jesus enjoyed life. He was the man of sorrows, but he wasn't a perpetual grouch. He enjoyed food. He enjoyed wine. And, and even though his critics exaggerated everything and called him a drunk and, drunk and a glutton, he wasn't that, but we can say that he seemed to enjoy life. We can say that Jesus wasn't drunk. He never sinned. And clearly in the Bible, drunkenness is a sin. We can say that Jesus 
wasn't quite like John. John's severe restriction on food and drink were well known. John was criticized because he never drank. Like, what kind of weirdo does that? But only, you know, only a demoniac would, would be like John was. But Jesus was criticized because in their eyes he drank too much. So make of that what you will. God pictures himself as a vineyard keeper in Isaiah 5, verse 1 to 7. God, it's a parable, but he goes and he plants a vineyard. And he sets the whole thing up and sets it up great and puts the plants in and the towers and the fence and the whole thing. And you say, well, what on earth does God want to get out of his vineyard? And the answer, well, you want out of your vineyard what everybody wants out of their vineyard when they plant them. Here's how this passage ends. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The men of Judah are his pleasant planting, and he looked for justice. But behold, bloodshed for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. So, so just as a man plants a vineyard and, and wants to harvest grapes to make wine, which is going to make his life better, he's going to enjoy that, the Lord planted his people with the idea that he could harvest justice and righteousness, and that would bring gladness, happiness to his heart. The Bible talks about wine in terms of relaxation. This is... Uh, from the book of Ruth, speaking about Boaz. And um, Boaz here is pictured as um, a type of Christ. Boaz speaks to us of what Christ is going to be like. He's, you know, as Jesus takes kind of the foreigner and, and uh, you know, Ruth has nothing and she's going to become married to Boaz and have a home and so forth. Jesus is going to take us to himself and we're going to live with him. We're pictured as the bride of Christ. And so Boaz is a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus. Ruth went down to the threshing floor, did just as her mother-in-law, Naomi, had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. And at midnight, the man was startled and turned over. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. That would be startling, right? So, so, so Boaz has a little bit of wine, and he's, he's kind of happy, and he's sleeping really hard, hard enough that she actually manages to sort of crawl in the tail end of his bed there and just lay down at his feet. And he said, who are you? And she said, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And so Boaz was apparently using wine as a kind of relaxation in his evening. Uh, I think maybe not in the, not in much of a different way than we today use caffeine for an unrelaxer. Right? That's, um, my girls come down the stairs in the morning and man, they're groggy and they head straight for the coffee pot and give them five minutes and then you can talk to them and it's great. And so, so we're thankful for that. We're, so we're, and, uh, and so we can appreciate uh, the drug that is caffeine. We have to note that no one ever drank too much Mountain Dew or Red Bull and went home in a, in a fit of caffeination, beat their wife and children, right? So alcohol and caffeine aren't parallel necessarily. Wine is used as a celebration enhancer. In Deuteronomy 14, God is laying out the rules for his people to bring their tithes to him. And what they're supposed to do is take a, a tenth of their grain and a tenth of all of their crops and they're to bring them to where the tabernacle is set up and they're going to have a big feast before the Lord. God basically says, you have to bring 10% of all your crops and everything, but you bring them to me and you use them to have a huge party just to celebrate, have the best time that you possibly can. Now, if you live a long ways away, God says... Just sell your stuff there, bring the money, and then come, because it's hard to transport that much of your crops, bring the money to the house of God and spend your money for whatever you desire, oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink, whatever your appetite craves, and you shall eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice, you and your household. This was part of celebration, celebrating. We know that Jesus in John 2, when he was at a wedding, kept the celebration alive because they ran out of wine and he he made more and he made new stuff and, and the the host you know he he tasted it and he's like man usually they bring out the good stuff first and then when people drink it they get a little bit less discriminating shall we say and so then they'll tolerate the bad stuff but you save the good stuff for last that's weird so so in in his mind he tasted what jesus made and he said this is good stuff this should have gone out first 
Jesus providing for the wedding feast echoes this wonderful feast that the Lord is going to have when Isaiah 25, on this mountain the Lord of hosts shall make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine, well refined. So, So the picture is the most luxurious banquet imaginable. And on the menu is well-aged wine, aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will make away from the end, take away from the end of the earth. For the Lord has spoken." Wine in the Bible is used as a celebration enhancer. If you're going to have a big party and you're going to have a good time, of course that's going to be there. It's going to be a part of it. Wine is used as a medicine. It's used as an antiseptic. The Good Samaritan uh, went to him, the man who had been bruised on the side of the road, bound up his wounds and poured on oil and wine. It was a good antiseptic, sort of an early hydrogen peroxide. It was used for tummy aches in 1 Peter 5. Paul says to Timothy, and I don't think he's actually talking about a a literal tummy ache, but what he says only works if this is actual medicine. When he says to Timothy, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Just look, just take something that's going to fix your problem. It's going to help make you feel better. Wine was used at the end of life. Proverbs 31, 6, Give strong drink to the one who's perishing and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. I uh, am not a fan of drugs, but I do remember a time when I, had, when I gave drugs to my own child on her deathbed. And, and we do this sort of thing to help ease pain, and to help sort of ease the transition from this life into the next. We don't necessarily like to do that, but it's something that we can try to do to help. In the Bible, those who abstained from wine uh, were often setting themselves apart. We'll see that. Abstaining from wine uh, was one way to separate the common and the sacred you know, you know, in the Bible, things were sort of categorized as clean and unclean, uh, common or holy, and the clean and the holy things were dedicated to God, and, and the common and the unclean things weren't necessarily evil of themselves, they just weren't sacred. And so when Samson was born, or he was about to be born, Samson and uh, Samson's dad and mom were asking the Lord Jesus, who was there with them, like, how do we take care of this kid? What are we going to do? And, and, and the angel of the Lord, probably the Lord Jesus, said to them very clearly, look, don't touch any wine, because this child is dedicated to you. There's a tremendous uh, benefit then to wine in, in the Bible. It's used for celebrations and happiness and uh, relaxation, medicine, it's used as an end-of-life sort of thing. But there's a tremendous danger behind it as well. So let me walk through this with you. One of the, one of the dangers of alcohol in the Bible is, is it can cause a person to become careless. Uh, they're not, shall we say, on top of their game anymore. Here's a murder plot unfolding. Absalom is going to go after his brother. And he says, Mark, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, strike Amnon, then kill him. You catch him. You catch him when he's just a little bit tuned up, he's not so sharp, and you'll be able to take him out. Wine causes people to make very foolish decisions. You remember this from Esther. We didn't, uh, it wasn't that long ago we talked about uh, Esther, worked our way through this, and on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded his seven eunuchs who served him to bring, uh, see how I did that? To bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the peoples and princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at, but Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. At this time, the king became enraged and his anger burned within him. He did a really stupid thing here, making his queen. He wanted to parade her around in front of his friends. That wasn't good. And then he got really angry. And, and, and wine was to blame for a bunch of that. I like to say that people rarely get drunk and do something smart. 
They just don't, right? <laughs> no. Proverbs 20 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Noah, in our text this morning, does something incredibly shameful and opens himself up to, to mocking. Strong drink a brawler. People get drunk, get into fights. Not smart. People can be taken advantage of when they're drunk. Again, this is, uh, so this is from Habakkuk. And, and uh, though this is speaking of something in a symbolic form, the reality is, is plain. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. One way to take advantage of somebody. You get them drunk. And then you can take advantage of them. Habakkuk goes on to say, you will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink and show your uncircumcision. There's a connection in the Bible between drinking and nakedness. And of course, that's still true in our day. Those who get drunk often move towards sexual immorality rather rapidly. There's a tight connection there in the Bible and in reality. One of the most grotesque stories, I think, in the Old Testament is that of Lot's daughters. Lot's daughter says this, Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. He didn't know when she lay down or when she arose. And then the next night, they did, the second daughter did this exact same thing. Utterly shameful. Utterly wicked. And uh, this doesn't reflect well on either Lot or his daughters. But the point is, you can be terribly manipulated when you're drunk. You can use wine to manipulate other people. Wine in the Bible is very inappropriate for those who are making significant, important decisions. This is again Proverbs 31. It's not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. You want people who are making significant decisions to be sharp. And wine will destroy that sharpness. So Leave it alone if you've got a significant decision that you have to make. Wine in the Bible is very inappropriate for those people who are doing holy things. Check this out. The Lord spoke to Aaron saying, Drink no wine or strong drink, you or your sons with you, when you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die. Isn't that interesting? So the people were told, Bring your tithes, bring your money, and if you feel like having wine and strong drink, before the Lord, do that. But priests, don't you touch it before you come in to see me, because if you do, you're going to die. And he says, it shall be a statute forever through all your generations. I think this is really significant, this verse here, because guess what happens to the Lord Jesus as he's coming to the cross? As he's coming to the cross, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. So the Lord Jesus, he's about to be crucified, and the soldiers apparently, who are not uh, known for their humanity, uh, but they said to him, tell you what, have some wine, it's got some gall in it, this will sort of take the edge off of you, right? Because Jesus is about to die, he's about to be nailed to a cross, we're talking massive pain. And so they offered him wine, strong drink, uh, with, with the gall, and he tasted it, and he said, mm-mm. No. Why? Well, what Jesus is doing there on the cross is so important. It is so holy. He's acting as our priest. He's going before the presence of God himself. And so he has to go into that moment in complete alertness and free from alcohol. Jesus essentially refused his end-of-life relief, and he did so for your sake and mine, so that as he hung on the cross, he was pure before God, and he did and said everything that he was supposed to, and he didn't do or say anything that he ought not to have done. Alcohol is inappropriate for those doing holy things. One of the dangers in the Bible of alcohol is addiction. Addiction, uh, it makes... It makes uh, shameful behavior become a shameful, wasted life. So if you're drunk, you do stupid things, and if you're addicted to it, you sort of live a stupid life. So who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Anybody want those things? 
who has complaining, wounds without cause. I don't know how I got beat up. Who has redness of eyes. Those who tarry long over wine. Those who go to try mixed wine. Don't look at the wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smooth. Because in the end, it bites like a serpent, stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart utter perverse things. You'll be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of a mast. I remember one night I was working in the subway in Biwabic. And uh, in Biwabic, in the Iron Range, the towns are notorious for the number of bars. And on Friday night and Saturday night, the subway would stay open till 3 o'clock in the morning. Other nights it closed at 10. But the reason it stayed open till 3 is because the bars had to close down at 1.30. And so the bars would all empty out between 1.30 and 2, and they'd all come to Subway. And so that hour from 2 to 3 uh, in the morning was a, was a really busy hour. And I just remember one guy coming in there, and he kept asking me, is it windy in here? Is it windy in here? And, and part of what I remember about that guy was he brought his daughter with him. And now his daughter was, I don't know, in her 30s or 40s. But I thought, how shameful for this young lady to have to sort of cart around her drunk dad who's standing there in a subway. And he said to me, it's blown me all over the place. Uh, well, he's like one who's lying on top of a mast. They struck me, you'll say. I wasn't hurt. They beat me, but I didn't feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. This becomes a lifestyle of woe and sorrow and shame. There's a tremendous danger here. Alcohol might have a sort of symbolic meaning. Check this out. This is Jesus, Luke 21. Watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness of cares of, and cares of this life. And that day, the day of the Lord, come upon you suddenly like a trap. That's interesting. Jesus is saying, you know, one of the marks of people who aren't really ready for the day of the Lord is drunkenness. Just sort of going through life doing what everybody else is doing. And so the use of alcohol might symbolize living for this world and not for the next. One of the uh, great dangers of alcohol is its ability to destroy the unity and harmony of the church. One, one, one reason that it's so difficult to even talk about it is that the subject is really divisive, especially in conservative, pietistic American churches like ours. Feelings about the subject run very strong, and sometimes we might think it's better just to avoid the subject altogether. I found that there are two major reasons Christians have really struggled with consuming alcohol. The first is that they've been terribly affected by alcoholic abuses. I've told you before that my great-grandpa, who I never met, was the kind of drunk who would pick up his check on Friday afternoon at the office, and before he got home in the wee hours of Saturday morning, he had drank pretty much all of it away. So he got home to his wife and kids and really had no money to give them for their food and their clothing. So my grandfather grew up hating alcohol, and understandably so. Michelle's great-grandpa as well, uh, who <laughs> her grandpa still describes to this day as a mean old Finlander. He used to get drunk nightly and when he was drunk, he would make his little daughter play pinochle. And if she ever won a game of pinochle, he would hurl all kinds of horrible abuse at her. Grandpa says he'd call her every name in the book. And it's no surprise then that until the day she died, Grandma Rose hated all things alcoholic. Some of you, God has rescued from a life of alcoholism, and alcohol is really a, a symbol of your past life. It, it controlled you, and like Noah, you did all kinds of shameful things under its influence. So, so now you hate it, and no wonder why. For some, you know that just, just one long look or one sip could plunge you right back into that life, and it scares you, and it, and it should, and you should need to stay clear of that. It's one reason Christians might hate alcohol altogether 
Abuse has personally impacted many lives in a profound way and created this deep-seated hatred for it. For many people, alcohol is entirely unredeemable. There's another reason that Christians struggle with this, and it's a cultural reason. Uh, Our society um, here in the States and going back into England has a conflicted and complicated relationship with it. Let me just take you back to England in the mid-1700s. London's population is swelling. People are leaving the countryside and flocking to the city to find work, and living conditions in London are terrible. They're awful. Poverty, widespread disease running rampant in part because they don't have a very good sewer system. So you got overcrowding, no toilets. It's bad. It's rough. But there's a new product readily available in London, and that product is gin. The 1720s to the 1750s are known in history as the gin craze. It's said that 10 million gallons of gin were distilled every year in London at this time. Alcoholism is rampant among men and women and even children. In an article entitled Mother's Ruin, writer Ellen Castillo writes, Much of the gin was drunk by women. Consequently, children were neglected. Daughters were sold into prostitution. And wet nurses gave gin to babies to quiet them. This worked, provided they were given a large enough dose. People would do anything to get gin. A cattle drover sold his 11-year-old daughter to a trader for a gallon of gin, and a coachman pawned his wife for a quart bottle. Writer George Reynolds wrote a kind of tribute to gin, and he wrote this, O gin, the genius of accidents and the bad angels of offenses worship thee. Thou art the juggernaut beneath whose wheels millions throw themselves in blind adoration. The pawnbroker points to thee and says, Whilst thy dominion lasts, I am sure to thrive. The medical man smiles as he marks thy progress, for he knows that thou leadest a ghastly train. Apoplexy, palsy, dropsy, delirium tremens, consumption, madness. The undertaker chuckles when he remembers thine influence, for he says within himself, Thou art the angel of death. And Satan rejoices in his kingdom, well knowing how thickly it can be populated by thee. Yes, great is thy power, O jinn. Thou keepest pace with the progress of civilization, and thou art made the companion of the Bible. For when the missionary takes the word of God to the savage in some far distant clime, he bears the fire water with him at the same time. While his right hand points to the paths of peace and salvation, his left scatters the seeds of misery, disease, death, and damnation. Who? England, 1720s. During those years in London, deaths skyrocketed they outpaced the number of births the number of births were declining and that was a major problem for the british government to try to grapple with and so one uh, author wrote this i'm paraphrasing it uh corbin morris was was uh, an employee of the government and he wrote in 1751 the decrease of births began when the consumption of gin by the common people became enormous As this consumption has been continually increasing since that time, the number of births has been continually decreasing. Do I need to mention the shocking loss, the sickly state of such infants as are born and struggle their way through the first stages of life? Very few living to manhood. Ask any of the hospitals in the city where they they have an increase of patients and what type of people they're seeing every day. They will all say they're seeing multitudes of swollen and consumptive people arising from the effects of spiritous liquors. A representative to the House of Commons in 1751, uh, or sorry, a a representation, a report to the House of Commons in 1751 on the effects of liquor estimates that since 1740, the annual loss of life in London by the premature deaths of sickly children under five and fewer by birth to be almost 10,000. It's rough. This is a rough period of time. But it's not as though things were better on this side of the Atlantic. There's an article entitled The 1800s When Americans Drank Whiskey Like It Was Water. The article says, We have oftentimes been a nation of drunks, but by today's standards, average alcohol consumption in large parts of the 19th century USA, the 1800s, was almost beyond rational belief. 
A historian by the name of Rohrabach wrote, By 1770, Americans consumed alcohol routinely with every meal. People began the day with an eye opener and closed it with a nightcap. People of all ages drank, including toddlers who finished off the heavily sugared portion at the bottom of a parent's mug of rum toddy. Each person consumed about three and a half gallons of alcohol per year. And when he says three and a half gallons of alcohol, he's talking about three and a half gallons of pure ethanol. So if you distill all the alcohol, three and a half gallons per year, to convert that into a more graspable figure, that's almost nine gallons of standard 80-proof liquor per year for the average person by the time of the American Revolution. But hold on to your seats because the number gets much higher by the 1800s. An English writer visiting the United States wrote this, I'm sure the Americans can fix nothing without a drink. If you meet, you drink. If you part, you drink. If you make acquaintance, you drink. If you close a bargain, you drink. They quarrel in their drink and they make it up with a drink. They drink because it's hot. They drink because it's cold. If successful in elections, they drink and rejoice. If not, they drink and swear. They begin to drink early in the morning. They leave off late at night. They commence it early in life and they continue it until they soon drop into the grave. By 1830, alcohol consumption reached its peak at a truly outlandish seven gallons of ethanol per year per capita, which works out to about 90 bottles of 80-proof liquor for every adult in the nation on average, including those who abstain. So it's a lot. Now, in the middle of the 1800s, then, just as this time is coming along, the United States experienced a second great awakening. And the second great awakening was uh, more emotional, more pietistic. Preaching was a lot more on a popular level, less explicitly theological than the great awakening a century earlier. I think perhaps that's why during the second great awakening, this religious fervor also gave rise to the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and the Seventh-day Adventists and any number of other religious or quasi Uh, religious Christian or quasi-Christian sects. More women were affected by the Second Great Awakening than men were. Preachers like Charles Finney thundered against alcohol in pulpits across the nation. Temperance societies dedicated to mitigating alcohol would spring up in churches across the land. I'm told that we had one here at Lewis Lake in our history. Women were fighting to keep alcohol out of their families, out of their church. And that resistance movement would really reach its pinnacle during Prohibition. Remember, it was only 102 years ago, in 1920, our nation actually amended the Constitution to prohibit the sale of alcohol. And then repealed that in 1933. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. The idea, though, is simple. Drunkenness ruins a man. And it ruins his family. So if you want to get rid of drunkenness, get rid of drink. And so alcohol takes on this stigma, particularly in the bastions of morality, which is the church. By the time you get to the 50s, which wasn't that long ago, any sort of alcoholic consumption, and tobacco too, was considered in large swaths of the American church to be a sin. And so I don't think any of us could imagine Billy Graham getting up into the pulpit with a beer in his hand. That's unthinkable. Couldn't even imagine that. And so what you need to understand is that in our tradition, there's a deep-seated and long-standing belief that consuming alcohol at all is improper and ungodly. And even if there's not explicitly biblical reasons that should be so, there's powerful cultural reasons that have really imprinted themselves on the consciences of millions of Christians who are just never going to be okay with it. They're just not. They've, many have made their peace with you know, the other things, going bowling, going to the theater to watch a movie, playing cards, uh, things Christians didn't do a generation or two ago. But consuming alcohol is just something they can never make their peace with. So, so what do we do? How, how do we work through this? How do we understand this? Well... Part of the struggle is that in the last 25 years or so, there's been a kind of gradual shift among conservative Christians toward alcohol. There's been a kind of a reaction to the staunch teetotalism of our grandparents. 
many people in my generation were really taught to stay away from it. But, but when they came to kind of ask the age-old covenant question, where is it written? They opened the Bible and they read the kind of things that I read to you this morning. So there's kind of a resurgence of Reformed theology, a admiration for the late medieval, early Reformation theologians who lived in a day when drinking beer was just kind of normal. Martin Luther used to brag about what a good beer maker his wife was. So, you know, there are some people who are very excited, and they're Christians, and they're very excited to pop a cork with Jesus someday. They read Isaiah 25, and they're like, ah, that's great. And there are some people who just can't stand the thought of it. They're going to have coffee with Jesus, and that's going to be great. And we have to be okay with that, right? All right, here we go. I'm going to get done. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean. And I would put wine in there and alcohol. But it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, I like this. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. If alcohol is not a problem for you, good. Enjoy it by yourself. (laughs) Right? And, and, and with your friends that that's okay with, right? The point is don't drag it and rub it in somebody else's nose who can't handle it. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. All right, I have more, but we'll be done. You're going to fire me anyway, so. <laughs> Lord, We're thankful for the many good gifts that you have given to us. Wonderful gifts, enjoyable gifts. And help us to be alert to the dangers that lurk beneath them. Lord, I pray this morning for those who are in the grip of alcoholic addiction. I pray that you would deliver them. I pray that you would grant them the power to break free. Lord, we don't need Noah-like characters shaming themselves, so deliver them. Lord, help us as a church and a society wrestle through this issue that can be so divisive. Lord, there are those here who are free to drink before you. Bless them. There are those here who, to honor your name, abstain. Bless them. Lord, help us as a church to grapple with this together, to live in tremendous harmony. Help us to understand each other. Help us to be a church that seeks to worship you in spirit and in truth together. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We'll skip the song. Sorry. I didn't mean to go so long. But let's stand. Yeah. Let's stand. And uh, I'll give you the benediction and let you go. See, there's no Sunday school, so I just felt free to keep going. So. (laughs) The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen. Doxologize and we'll be dismissed. Praise God Lord bless you. Have a wonderful day. You are dismissed.